if you yes, if you start up. Right. Our uh, second speaker this morning is uh, Andrew Vordin from the British Interplanetary Society. He's going to give a presentation about uh, their Kicksat sprites. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I've got a whole load of information here, which I shall refer to once in a while. So if you just don't mind, I'll quickly grab that, just in case anybody asks me any questions that I can't remember the answers to, which I know you will. So I don't know how many people here have uh, heard of Kicksat sprite. Um, no, nope, I've got some head shaking, no, no, good, excellent. So what I'll do is I'll run through this little presentation. I might stop at certain points to see if anybody's got any questions. I've got Lawrence in the front row there, who's uh, one of the technical team. I should say, for the, just for clarity, I'm not one of the technical people, although I'm getting there, I suppose. <laughs> so I'm more sort of uh, making sure things take logical steps and actually getting there on time. Uh, we've got a whole team of different people doing different roles. So let me just run through the uh, presentation, which is not a PowerPoint, so it'll be a bit different. There you go, that's the presentation. Let me just zoom in. So, Kicksat starts with a um, normal CubeSat. There's a, a render of it there rather than actually the real one. The real one's just been uh, created. Uh, that's the normal CubeSat, and it's called, we call it a Kicksat. So let me go on to, oops, I'm trying to Skype in. Let's go into uh, what actually that does. So normal CubeSat, I think everybody in the room will know what that is. So let me just move on to the sprite. So what it's all about. There we go. That is, that there is the satellite we're putting up. Except we're not putting one of them up. We're putting 128 of them up all at the same time. So all in that little uh, cube that you saw earlier will be 128 of them. If I just grab this here, there it is with a light on, um, or with the light off now, there it is, lights on. All underneath it is is the, the board that makes it communicate with the, the launch pad, which makes it communicate with the computer. But the actual satellite is that part there. And I know you're going to have a bunch of questions about that earlier. What we'll do is we'll get this up and running out there so you can actually see it later and you see the uh, it actually transmitting and, and saying something. So there's going to be 128 of those going up in that one CubeSat. There's a, a 101 of them will be programmed identically. So they all have exactly the same code on them. Um, and they'll be programmed by Zach Manchester, who's running this in America from Cornell University, and he's currently at, at NASA. Up to 27 of them will be programmed by KickSat supporters. So, so perhaps I should say at this point how this was funded. NASA didn't want to, or didn't ever have the money spare to, to fund this, even though they were very interested in the output, they never had the money to, to fund this. So what it actually happened was it got um, supported by a crowdfunded uh, method, which is Kickstarter. So another kick, there's too many kicks in this project. But, um, so, which ben basically meant that every individual in the whole world could pledge some money to support the project. Different levels of money got you different things. Um, the BIS supported it at a grand level, a lot of um, individuals in the BIS supported it at a, at a lesser level, so there's a lot of us got different things. So if you pledged a dollar, you basically got a thank you. If you, do if you pledged a couple of hundred dollars, you got a dummy one of those. But in actual fact, one of our members has upgraded the dummy one of those to a real one of those, one of those over there. And if you pledged more than that, it was quite a lot more than that, you've got the developer kit, which we've got over there, which means you can program your own sprite, um, which is what they're called, and you can do what you want to with your, with your sprite. It will go up with the rest of them, but it can be doing different things. So the 128 of them all coming out of that one CubeSat. So the BIS, we've got one programmable sprite. So that's the one over there, in fact. But all we need to do for, for the actual ones at NASA, which are just being printed at the moment, is send NASA our code. We don't need to actually send them our sprite. We'll keep our sprite and uh, um, just send them the code. Um, now we will have 12 sprites in orbit, so I've got my own little sprite, which won't be running my own code, but it will be running my own message. So it'll probably, it, mine will be saying Biz80, because it's our 80th anniversary, the, the longest established uh, astronautical society in the world. So it's our 80th anniversary, and mine will be saying Biz80. The other 10 or 11 will be saying Biz1, Biz2, Biz3, or some other message. We just have to receive those. 
Um, they're called souvenir sprites that people have got as well. So they can do what they want with them. They can do a few tests on them. They can pl plug them in. My souvenir sprite in the moment is in Yorkshire. And we've got somebody who's 16 years old, just left school, just about to go to college, who's programming that and uh, trying to get the, the main processor to save the state of the of the message. So rather than keep retransmitting from scratch every time it loses power, which it will, because it's solar powered, um, it'll remember where it got to and just transmit the next bit. You'll have loads of questions on this, I should think, in a minute. So I'll whiz by until we get to the questions bit. That's the that's the timeline, which is a bit small for you to see. November 2011. At the moment, December 2013. Check that says 2013. Yes, yeah, 2013. Good. Make sure my bits are correct there. Um, let me zoom in on that. So in, in November 2011, Zach Meister and Michael Johnson, who I believe you'll be hearing from later by Skype, um, launched the Kicksat on Kickstarter. And BIS were one of the, the first people to, to put our money into that uh, to make sure it got off the ground. In December 2012, the BIS investors, like me, received our souvenir sprites, which actually didn't have the solar cells on and didn't have the radio. In February 2013, BIS received the development kit, which is what you see over there with the light flashing, which you can see more of when we, when we move out there and actually get the whole system running. In September 2013, so coming up, we've got to program our sprite. We're making quite good progress on that, and that's at the stage we're at at the moment. We've, got, we've divided ourselves into a number of different sort of units. We've got programmers and the radio people. Unfortunately, neither of the two main radio people could be here. One's in China. Uh, some um, some fantastic show going on in China um, to do with astronautics and radios. Um, went to Paris to China, and the other one's got family commitments. But they are, you know, like many of you. you know, one of them's got massive aerials on his roof and got many many things. And he's going to teach Lawrence and I all the stuff we need to know at a later date about the uh, receiving of the signals. And in fact, we've already got Faraday boxes and all sorts of things lined up, so, uh, which Lawrence and I need to, to understand. At the moment, we're still programming it to make sure that it does other exciting things, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what we're actually doing in a minute when we get to that stage. At the moment, the launch, and it's a free launch, so NASA, even though they couldn't fund the mission, they do keep a little bit of space aside for interesting CubeSats. We're on, we've got a guaranteed place on one, of those, um, on one of those missions. It's currently December 2013. Realistically, we do expect it to go into 2014, but the cutoff for the code is still September mid-September, late September maximum for the, for the code, getting the code up there. Um, between then and then, we've got to start building our ground stations, which is the, the interesting bit, which we haven't done a huge amount on at the moment. So let's just focus on the programming options at the moment. So that the programming options, and I've highlighted the bottom one at red, which you'll probably struggle to see, but we'll be giving up this obviously to AMSAT anyway. Um, the, the main programming options were sort of be more ambitious than Zach Manchester, which seemed a little bit dangerous, be less ambitious than Zach Manchester, which was a, a little bit safe, um, or do something completely new with, with what we've got there. And we've taken the approach of uh, doing something new. So we could have just changed what, we've, what, what Zach's got, or we could have gone for just a different message, but no, we're actually using the same sensors to do different things. Inside those sensors on there, and I should tell you what sensors we've got, we've got the main processor, an MSP430, which is a, a very simple processor, which is brilliant for um, switching on and off. So it's very fast. So when we lose the cellular power, it switches off, and it very quickly switches back on again. We've got uh, a gyroscope and a magnetometer. That's it. Um, the gyroscope has got a temperature sensor in it, and the main processor has got a temperature sensor in it. We're actually going to be getting data from the temperature sensors. Now, whilst that won't tell you a lot about space, it will tell you um, a lot about the performance of the sprite. So at least 101 of the sprites will be all the same, and they'll all be transmitting a message, whatever the message is, such as biz80. They'll be transmitting the gyroscope data, and they'll be transmitting the magnes uh, magnetometer data. And that's what they'll be doing. Our one, if our one survives, and that's the point of having 128 of them, is we know a lot of them aren't going to survive, but hopefully enough of them will. If our one survives, we'll be getting temperature data, and we'll be able to see we can use the two sensors to kind of calibrate each other within a, within a, a tolerance. It's not actually going to be totally calibrated, but we'll be able to tell uh, temperature variance. We'll also be able to tell if the temperature is slowly increasing 
or whether it's just going like that as, it, as the sun um, effectively doesn't. Um, but equally, if, we, if the temperature goes up and up and up and up and then it stops transmitting, we might take some sort of uh, knowledge from that. So it, it, this is a proof of concept mission. That's the important thing. This is not going to, this in itself is not going to provide some science that's absolutely you know, groundbreaking. This is a proof of concept mission. The ultimate mission for this will be to have about 10,000 of these, but not this size. This is, the, this is the size that you can just about solder your own bits on. The actual size of the, the printed ones will be about that big, size of a little fingernail, and there'll be 10,000 of them. So if this is successful and, and they get it working and people receive the signals, it'll be 10,000 of them. That's, that's mission two. Um, so anyway, so we're going to go for the temperature data. Let's uh, zoom on. That's the current time scale. And then we've got the preparations to receive signals, which we're not at that stage yet. But we, as I say, we have two people busy in the background making a lot of progress and giving a lot of thought to it. And will Doppler shift be relevant? Do we need a, 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 a metal box to stick it in if we're receiving it from the BIS? Yes, we will because of taxis and various other things. Um, but at the moment, it's all about the programming. That, that comes next. And there'll be a lot of work done globally. It won't just be the BIS. There'll be every, gl all the owners globally and a lot of very other interested parties are going to be trying to receive these things because they're completely new. Nobody's ever done it before. Nobody's ever done anything like this before. So receiving those signals is not going to be easy. They're tiny. I should just say as well that that sprite won't have any protection. It's not, go it's not going up in a steel box. It's not going to be protected in any way. It's literally flung into low Earth orbit that will go around for 48 hours minimum, six weeks maximum, and then burn up. No protection. The prototypes were stuck on the outside of the ISS, the International Space Station, and they survived. They were OK. So, uh, so we know they're going to survive, but we know a lot of them will break. But that's the point of redundancy in numbers. So it's a totally new concept. Instead of multi-million dollar satellites, $35 satellites. So it's one step beyond what, uh, what Strand did with, with, the, with the phone. So that's, that's kind of it, I think. So uh, questions? Anybody got any questions? Yes. I see you're using GNU Radio for um, the, the ground station side. Um, are you aware that there that they do actually have a live USB distribution now. I believe it's available on the ETA's website. On yes, for the, for, for Linux, but it's a yeah. it's a plug it in and go. Yeah. That yeah. might be useful for for for, for some people. What we looked at as well was actually creating a um, virtual machine, so we can actually have the whole Linux installation in a virtual machine. As long as your computer's powerful enough, um, you'd put the virtual machine on. Then there's you don't even need to have Linux going. You can just literally have a Windows or an Apple. But um, Lawrence was looking at um, having a single installation for Windows, which is a long way off at the moment because of sound cards on Windows. Apple Mac's a little more realistic. But Zach Manchester in America is also looking at the same thing. At the moment, it's all about, uh, well, the, the CubeSat had to be completed. Now it's the programming. A lot to do. Even though it's a, like a tiny little thing, there's quite a lot to do in it in a limited amount of time. I think he's been lucky that um, it's been pushed back by a few months, but that was always going to happen. But yes, thank you very much. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, Jim Heck. I've got a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll uh, try and grab you later on. But we'll be, we'll but be out on the table with a demonstration. Excellent. I'm looking there. forward to seeing it. But sort of, sort of burning issues, you mentioned a lifetime of six weeks. Yes. Is that because of the radiation you're expecting, or is it because of the or type of orbit that's going orbit. to decay? Yeah, okay. Be quite low. yeah okay. We I haven't got the exact height of the orbit yet, so NASA have given us a, a range. That's okay. why I said it's 48 hours to six weeks. They've okay. given us a, a range of where we'll be um, dropped off. Okay, uh, and could you say a little bit about the downlink, like what the um, data rate is going to be, what frequency is going to be, and what sort of antennas you need at, at the receive station, or is that sort right. of completely unknown? No, 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 that's, that's no. Actually, um, in America, they've just updated the, um, the transmitter on that, so they've just updated the crystal so that it's more stable at different temperatures, because they realised that that one was going to be a little bit unstable with the temperature fluctuation. So we've got the old um, one of those at the moment, but the and I've got a note here just to make sure I don't get this wrong. This is, this is very important. So the sprites themselves will be 437.240 megahertz. Okay. 
um, and the kicks at is 2.4 gigahertz or a swathe of bands around the 2.4 gigahertz. NASA and Zach Manchester aren't telling us whether that's got an uplink, but if it does have an uplink, it'll be an off switch, and that's it. It's a kill. So basically, good neighbor policy, switch off, please. That's it. That's all it will. The CubeSat will have proper uplink, downlink. I don't know what the, it's just normal CubeSat stuff on that. But the downlink on that is very, very slow. So we're looking at about one ASCII character per second. Very slow. We've done the tests on the um, signal strength, um, and we're actually going to print some more of these and do a few extra tests on them. So I suspect that we'll be going to either the hills of Sussex or the Lake District, so we can stand on top of hills and somebody on the next hill um, with attenuators. But they've done that in America, and it comes out as four times the power of a GPS satellite because of the distance, because they're so close. Not because it's actually four times the power of a GPS, but the, the actual end result is four times the power on, on paper. Right. Do we have any questions from the internet? Okay. Any further questions in the room? Right. Well, I'd like to thank Andrew for a, a fascinating talk, and I'm sure you'll be around in the break. We'll be around. We'll be out there. We'll actually show the new radio. We'll show the little tiny message coming up. Obviously, it's a, a, a link that's right next to each other, so not actually uh, difficult to get mm -hmm. to receive. I think, I think most of you who know how to receive stuff are going to be thinking, 